Okay, we are on part two of our fisheries for the future notes, and this is fertilization methods. So we're going to go through um, about 25 more slides. Um, things are going to get a little faster when we go into the next couple of parts, because we do have 250 or so, 280 actually, slides to go through, but um, some, some of them are really fast. So. For example, you'll see some today that are pretty quick, like this one. Um, it's a kind of review, right? So you've got different fertilization methods that we're going to talk about today. We know that external occurs outside and internal occurs inside, so just obvious things there. <clears throat> so with external, there are some problems and there some are you know, advantages. Um, that's pretty much everything in biology. Um, so with the problems, they're oftentimes tried to be solved by, uh, or at least lessened through adaptation, right? And that's changing the physiology and behavior in a specific way that helps to alleviate those problems. Um, and the problems are low chance of fertilization because the sperm and eggs are out there Externally, the parents don't know where they are, and they might come together or they might not come together. There's some degree of uncertainty about the meeting, right? And that's called broadcast spawning because you saw the picture of the clam last time um, putting sperm out into the water. That's just, here we go, let's hope things work. Releasing them into the open water. It's very wasteful if no mate is present. And most of them won't ever meet another gamete. <clears throat> and then, of course, the eggs, even before they're fertilized, let alone being fertilized eggs, they're going to be eaten up by all the little fishies and plankton and things like that. So, you release massive numbers of gametes, and that compensates for the inefficiency of the broadcast spawning. So they've got millions and millions of them, even if 5% got fertilized, that would be a very large amount. And so um, pheromones are chemical signals, but also lunar, lunar uh, cycles and things like that. They synchronize the release of gametes. So the males and females, and all of them, not just one male and one female, all of them will re first release gametes and say, hey, it's time, guys and girls. Let's release our gametes. Okay. And then they do it. And then um, they typically aggregate in the same area because of uh, habitat. They're not going to live in a habitat that's not suitable to their survival. So, And then um, that random, that extreme random fertilization where you know, you're not picking your mate, any mate you get is what you get, that's going to increase genetic diversity much greatly, much more greater. -er. That's not science. Okay, <clears throat> that's bad English. Okay, so then, so comparing the external to the internal now, right, which a vast array of different kinds of organisms, from invertebrates to cartilaginous fish to bony fish, um, Actually, I don't know if there's any bony fish that have internal fertilization. Cartilaginous fish, like sharks, we'll talk about that. And then, of course, your mammals. Um, that requires one organism to introduce the gametes inside the other, so fertilization, take, fertilization takes place inside the body. Much higher probability. You're putting them where they belong immediately, right? And then... The, the, the neat thing about this is that animals evolved on land, once, once animals evolved on land, they couldn't rely on water to carry their eggs and sperm around. If they just released their eggs and sperm, they'd go on the ground, right? And they would die, dry out, desiccate, and, and uh, you know, desiccate, dry up, or get, get lost, right? Okay, and so, but it oftentimes involves com complex courtship because now you've got two adults who are competing over food, 
and other resources coming together and they have to uh, kind of convince each other that you should mate with me. And that's complex, okay? Complex courtship routines. And then of course you need a special organ or other structure to introduce those uh, gametes together. So male whales, for example, will, uh, they have a penis, introduce sperm into the female vagina. Once deposited there, uh, they swim up the fallopian tube. This should sound familiar because this is just how people do it. Um, if you didn't know that already. So during the breeding season, the female whales become fertile along with the males, and then they migrate to breeding grounds. Um, I believe in the Pacific Ocean, at least, they migrate to Hawaii. That's where the breeding grounds are for Pacific humpback whales. Um, comp complex courtship between the sexes uh, to choose which mate. And then most whale species are not monogamous. Mono meaning one, one mate, so they are not monogamous. And both sexes will mate with several different partners during one breeding season. And of course we know that's probably to ensure um, the strongest sperm get to the eggs and then it ensures their chance or helps to ensure their chance that they're going to have a baby. And then an effort to gain a competitive advantage Male whales make large quantities of sperm to try to outnumber the other males. I mean, they don't do it on purpose. Their bodies just do it, right? And then uh, sharks also will have group courtship in a mating. So when the female is ready, multiple males will try to come and uh, mate with the female. So. Uh, this happens with mammals as well. So special organ structure. Um, we're not going to look at mammal penises here, but because you kind of have a good idea of that. Um, but what uh, sharks, <clears throat> certain species, okay, um, they have claspers. So you can see the female does not have these claspers. She has, uh, they both have a cloaca. That's that multi-purpose port that serves as the entry and exit of all materials in and out of that area. Um, they don't have multiple holes for urinating or the vaginal canal or the anus. Okay, it's all one. It's called the cloaca. And the, the male will insert the claspers into the female's cloaca and eject the sperm that way. <clears throat> Very unique for a fish. Because no other fish does that, okay? Now this is a little review, knowing where those, um, those pelvic fins are because these are um, modified pelvic fins, okay? So the pelvic fins are here, the anal fin is back here in, in bony fish at least, okay? And you have to know these terms. So this is in your notes, you could do this later. So um, just as a, from the AS syllabus. And speaking of the AS syllabus, just so I don't miss any beats here, the first two parts of the test for the ACE Marine starting on the 27th and the 29th, the AS level, are just semester one material. Only semester one material. So you should at this time be formulating patterns of study for semester one. Minimally, and I mean like this is the basic minimalism here, is studying your notes. A more advanced level would be creating those index cards and using the Leitner method to get ready for that first part, of that first you know, half. The second half, the A-level test, is um, on the second semester stuff, this stuff, including unit nine, which we're gonna get to next, and peppered with the stuff from the AS level. So you would need to interject 
pieces and information and vocabulary from the AS from semester one to help bolster your answers, strengthen for the A-level part. Does that make sense? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we were transparent with that. Okay. Summary. So here's a summary. Um, we're not going to spend too long here because this is just a summing up the last two. So external, disadvantages, advantages, and adaptations. Went over these already. And then internal. So this is really a comparison. Uh, this is not in your notes, I don't think, but it, um, it's a good way to come back and have a single picture of comparing and contrasting because you may very well have an A-level question that tells you to compare in external and internal fertilization uh, pertaining to their advantages and disadvantages, and this would be a great um, visual for that type of question. So when you're studying or making your notes, come back to this. All right, now we're going to talk about parental care. So um, there are two different kinds of strategies for parental care in the biological world, okay? And you can see here, R strategy and K strategy. Now, don't ask me what the R and K specifically mean. Um, like, what does R stand for and K stand for? I honestly don't know. I just know that R is very is is like what the clam does, or corals do, or sponges do, or organisms that don't have much parental care do. Okay, and then K is fewer offspring, but higher parental care. That is the major difference between the two types of strategies for passing genes from one generation to the next. So let's talk about each of these today. So here's an example. You're going to have to write down some uh, uh, examples from this slide, but so on the R side versus the K side over here, these offspring are going to release millions of sperm and eggs into the water or the environment. They're not going, not all of them will find another gamete to fertilize, okay? And no care is given to them by the parents, virtually none. Um, they get their nourishment from what's already in the egg, called the yolk sac. Go to a frog, closer to K. Frogs have several different ways. One particular species of frog carries the baby, babies in its back, like little holes, pores open up in its back, and the babies, the eggs are in each of those pores. There are uh, some organisms, some fish, and some frogs that fit in this that are mouth breeders. They will keep their babies in their mouth. They don't eat them. They keep them in there. It's a nice little pouch to protect their babies and oxygenate the eggs until the babies are old enough to leave. They're called mouth brooders. Not breeders, brooders. Okay. Then you get to the rabbits, and they, are, they have less offspring than these. As we go up, they have less and less offspring. Um, these are kind of tied with that, though. And, but they have more of them, right? 12 to possibly more offspring a year. They can have like three or four litters every year, rabbits. Um, and they do expend energy because they're mammals, right? Feeding them milk and making sure that they are old enough to leave the nest to live on their own. And then, of course, whales, chimps, and then humans, right? Um, very similar in their K strategies. So that's a good graphic. So our strategy again, millions of offspring, no parental care, we got that already. They simply release them with virtually no care at all. Some will make a nest to do the fertilization and put the eggs in, some will hide the eggs somewhere um, and then leave life or die. I mean, look at salmon that swim up the river 
lay their eggs, fertilize, you know, the male and female, external fertilization, female lays or puts her eggs out, male sprays his sperm on them, and then they die. <laughs> That's it. There's no way they could take care of them. Um, but then there's invertebrates, invertebrates now, not vertebrates, like the octopus who will lay her eggs and stay with them until they hatch and then she dies. So there's all different kinds of this and that would be not quite as our strategy, but not, you know, they, they don't, after the babies are alive, they don't stay alive and take care of them and protect them. So it's not quite case strategy either. It's kind of the middle. Um, and just pure chance, okay? High mortality, 1% survival rate. These are alevins, or one of them is an, you know, this is the plural, eleven or alevin. Um, these are little baby fish that have the yolk sac, so they're, they're out of the egg, but when, once they're out, they still carry this source of energy with them, kind of like a suitcase if it was sewed to the side of your body, all right? Um, and, they're, and they continue to get energy from that as they survive and uh, metamorphosize through the, their larval stage into the adult stage. And so there's a giant clam again producing billions of eggs, but only one or two will make it to adulthood. Maybe none for that particular individual. Tridacna gigas, the giant clam. I used to have a giant clam shell, one of the valves. Remember, the, uh, a mollusk's shell is called a valve. Um, and I removed and I left it. I don't know why. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't teaching marine science at the time. I was teaching chemistry, so I guess I didn't think I needed it. Um, and then now we're going to talk about tuna. So the giant clam and the tuna. Tuna produce up to 25 million eggs per year. This is what fertilized tuna eggs look like. No parental care, obviously, they're, because they, they really have to just keep swimming. They have to swim to um, get that water over their gills, right? That's the kind of fish that they are. And only a fraction of them will become adult tuna. Most of them will have died during the larval stage. Here are tuna larva in different stages. Look how big their head and mouth are compared to their body for just trying to eat as much as possible. They're very voracious creatures. So the male and female will migrate. The male tuna and the female tuna, they pretty much spend their adult lives out here, okay? And here we're talking about um, different um, populations, okay? You've got an uh, eastern ocean population and a western ocean population in the Atlantic. So here's Florida, right? Gulf of Mexico is <clears throat> um, where there's spawning grounds, as well as in the Mediterranean Sea, there's spawning grounds. So they will migrate to those spawning grounds at certain times of the year, for the breeding season. And it all has to do with the water temperature of the spawning ground. When the water temperature is right, they sense it, and they head that way. Um, and we already said this. Bluefin, bluefin congregate in distinct spawning grounds in uh, the Pacific Ocean. Okay, this is yellowfin tuna on, in the Atlantic. Um, oh, no, this is bluefin also. Yes, yeah, sorry. Why did I see? I thought I saw yellowfin up here somewhere. I guess not. Okay, but there's a Pacific bluefin as well. And then by, here's the point here. By congregating in the same area, it increases the likelihood of a successful mating and fertilization. And that means that genetically different tuna will breed together. And why, again, is that important? Because you learn this in biology class. It's about genetic diversity. Well, most of you did. There's like one or two of you that for some reason didn't take biology. But, um, when you have that randomness, you're increasing genetic diversity, which helps the population, or the species, I should say, survive. So we're going to go through these different stages, um, just like we did last time with the shrimp. But um, So we've got distinct and fixed male and female. 
They live in the open ocean. They migrate to the spawning grounds where they spawn. The eggs get fertilized, the larvae hatch, and they become juveniles and the cycle starts all over again, okay? It's influenced by the temperature and the season, congregating and re releasing broadcast spawning into the water. So the females will release the eggs, the males detect that through chemical signals, um, and then they will, it's clouds of it, you know? So you've got this cloud meeting another cloud, and that's where the fertilization takes place. Random, totally random external fertilization. Because, you know, it's not just the male and female. You've got a giant school of them all doing this at the same time. Whatever sperm gets to whatever egg first, that's the one that wins. <clears throat> then the eggs float. They're buoyant because they have oils in them. They hatch after about two days fast. And then many, not just some, but many of them are eaten by predators. And we don't mean like sharks, right? Because these things are very small. Um, plankton and tiny fish, and even themselves. The larvae will eat the eggs that aren't hatched yet. <clears throat> the feed on larvae of all species. Um, and you can see, I told you, they have this disproportionately sized head and mouth uh, compared to their body and that just helps them be able to fit more in. Whenever they come across something to eat, they're gonna be able to eat it. And of course, the juveniles would not be sexually mature yet, hence the term juvenile. Um, and they will move from the spawning ground out into the open ocean, and they tend to school together to avoid predation. That's called shoaling. And so um, the advantages, yes, the advantages of this life cycle, they um, allow synchronization so that they're in few areas at one particular time, the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so that makes both males and females present, which increases the chance of fertilization. If the males went first, and then left their sperm, and then the females came days later, the sperm would be too spread out, right? Or would die due to lack of nutrition. Same with the eggs. And that, uh, so now, that, and you've got juveniles in one part and adults having left a long time ago after the fertilization has occurred, um, now they're not competing for food either. So there's no, no or reduced competition between the juvenile stages and the adult stages. So let's talk about K strategy now. So again, the K strategy is fewer offspring and the cost of producing fewer offspring is you have to stay back with the offspring and raise it. You have to raise the young uh, and provide that energy instead of producing all the sperm and eggs and just you know going through all that process you use that energy and 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 staying and ensuring that your offspring will be able to survive on its own without you or without it okay so they provide food protection but there's still risks there's still risks because if you only have one or two offspring they may not survive due to predation environmental conditions, starvation, whatever, okay? What if the parent dies, you know, due to predation or even hunting, uh, and now the babies are on their own <clears throat> and the babies won't survive? So whales are mammals, we know that, um, and they're viviparous. It means the offspring develop inside the mother viviparous these are this word and a couple other words today you again you i believe you learned them in biology class um 
And we did talk a little bit about them, I think, when we talked about last semester, when we talked about um, sharks. But we'll talk about it again now, okay? Because it's really supposed to be in this unit. All right. Um, the developing calf is in the mother's uterus, and, and through the placenta, just like, you know, just like humans, they're, we're mammals, um, the umbilical cord feeds them oxygen and food, and, and then gets rid of the waste. So gestation period for humpback whale ranges from uh, 10 months to 16 months, uh, six, ten, 10 months for humpback whale, 16 for a sperm whale. Here's sperm whale, um, humpback whale, my favorite animal. But only one calf is born at a time and will be nourished and protected by the mother. So I think you got the difference, the main differences between our strategy and K strategy. It's just that you really have to know the life cycles for the dolphin and the shrimp. Those are the two life cycles that we talked about during the last set of notes. Um, you know, for the course. So that's why we're not going through like entire life cycles of these other organisms. All right. So one calf is born, protected and nurtured by its mother. Um, again, we know that it has milk from mammary glands and it stays with the mother and family groups, okay? So some species like the sperm whales are known to share babysitting duties while the mother goes off to hunt. So the mother will leave the baby with other adults and go hunt and come back. Pretty amazing. And then um, until it's sexually mature, it could be anywhere from two to five years, depending upon the species of whale. Now sharks, let's talk about sharks. They are cave strategists, and they have three main methods to do so. I would, they're not as um, on that scale from R to K. They're not up there with whales and dolphins and, and land mammals, okay? But they're better than other fish, let's put it that way, <clears throat> and other marine organisms. And there's three methods we just talked about, viviparity, or viviparity, no, it's probably viviparity, it's viviparous, so we've got Oviparous, oviparity, same thing. The British like to use these terms. It's oviparous, ovoviviparous. That's a mouthful. And then viviparous. So oviparous, ovoviviparous, and viviparous. Let's talk about each of those right now. All right, so in your notes, um, you have this summary of ovo, ovo, vi, oh, sorry, oviparity, ovoviparity, and viviparity. Vi, vi, it, it can't be any other pronounced any other way. Why? I'm, I've been teaching marine science for years, and I've never heard them spell this way. Anyway, oviparous, ovoviviparous, and viviparous. Okay, so um, when you see these words, you have to know that that's the same thing. So you're gonna write a description uh, of each based upon the notes, which we haven't covered fully yet, uh, but you have that video and um, one of the words already defined. Types of fertilization they are, laying of eggs, um, that's yes or no. Nutrients to develop the embryo, where do they come from? Is there a placental connection and what's that about? And is how did the embryos develop? So your, your chart is eventually going to look like this, but you'll have to go back into the notes to find that or just fill it out um, from what we're about to say, which here we have oviparous, okay? So, or ovo, oviparity, oviparity. It's can, how else can you pronounce that? So this is the egg-laying shark. Ovo or ovi means egg, okay? Anything with ov, ov means egg. So after fertilization, the females of some shark species, they make these egg pouches called mermaids' purses. You might see them washed up on the shore sometimes if you are lucky enough, okay? 
and they attach them to rocks or seaweeds, and they are often guarded by the female. Closer to K strategy, right? And they have the egg sac and the young inside. <clears throat> and high concentration of nutrients. And when that yolk sac is depleted of nutrients, the young shark pushes its way out and is a fully formed version of its parent, which is pretty amazing. And in, uh, I, honestly, in Florida, I've been to the beach a lot and I have not seen many of these. Um, but they do wash up. In New York, I've, a lot more. I don't know why, but in New York, we would find a lot more uh, mermaids' purses than down here, but they still are findable. I'll uh, take this a picture of one later, that what it would look like. It wouldn't look like that. It would be uh, black or dark. <coughs> Sorry. Ovo viviparous. <coughs> These are also ovo eggs, right? Fertilized and hatched, but they're inside. <coughs> Vive alive so the eggs are inside the living mother right okay and um hatched inside and then the mother gives birth to those live uh, offspring into the water while inside now this is interesting the young develop um they use their a yolk sac for nutrition but <clears throat> um well, that's not, that's not the develop. That's not the part I was thinking about. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Good supply of oxygen from the mother inside the body and less chance of being eaten if just left as an egg outside. Okay, because once they come out, they're essentially predators. Once they, so um, that's, that's the advantage. They're less um, able to be preyed upon. And... That picture is kind of self-explanatory. It's cut open, so it's hard to see, but those were eggs. All right, and um, here, this, was this it? Maybe, I don't know. Okay, so continuing with oviviparous, some juvenile sharks um, are brooded inside the mother's body, right? We talked about that just now, protected lo for longer. Um, but this means the young need more food. Because if they hatch from the yolk, from the egg, they no longer have that food supply. So here's, the, here's what I was talking about. In the thresher sharks, <clears throat> that's the group in the back there by the door, they, so the mom will continually, you know, have eggs in that, Womb. The, 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 the eggs, the sharks, that the babies that are, are hatched will eat the mother's eggs as she's producing them. And that's called oophagy. Phage means to eat, and then o is the egg thing. So they're eating eggs, ovulated by the mother, until they are uh, larger and can leave. Okay? Now the sand tiger shark, check this out, you may have heard of this before, but the sand tiger will um, undergo embryophagy. That's like if you had twins inside a mom, like a human, right, imagine this, and the one twin got hungry and ate the other twin. Whoa, that's crazy, that, that's what they're doing intrauterine cannibalism so um and so the the baby's in the mother eating its siblings inside the inside the, the the uterus um and also only one or two will survive that type of behavior that's just crazy so that talk about survival of the fittest right <clears throat> And then there's viviparous. This is the closest form of shark case strategy to us and, and ma mammals like whales, you know, and dolphins and, and the like um, that fish do. And so 
They give birth to fully formed young that have been nourished via a placental-like structure. So during the development, these embryos use up the yolk. So they have a yolk still, um, and parts of the egg, co egg covering for nutrition. Then the, the part that's left over attaches to the uterine wall of the, of the mom. In a similar, similar way, the placenta of mammals attaches. It's not exact, okay? And then a cord containing blood vessels transports blood and food to that organ, which is like the umbilical cord. Similar to human's umbilical cord. Waste products go out into the mother's blood and nutrients go in. Glucose, amino acids from the mother's blood. So when born, these sharks are fully developed and can swim away from their mother to live independently uh, straight away. And hammerhead sharks, bull sharks will do this. 